All right. Hello. My name is Matthew Gallant, and I'm a game developer at Naughty Dog. And I'm also a Canadian and a Canadian history enthusiast. <laughs> so for that reason, I decided to play um, Remembrance Island, which is a creative mode map for Fortnite, uh, a game I usually I don't have too much experience with generally, but um, I was very intrigued to play this map. Firstly, because it is uh, Remembrance Day themed, uh, and it's about Canadian, uh, you know, remembering Canadian veterans specifically. Uh, but also, just how weird it is that this thing exists at all. Uh, this map is. Uh, first came to my attention um, on Twitter, and it uh, was promoted on the official um, Royal Canadian Legion website uh, as being developed by them. Uh, and that struck me as being very weird tonal mix right off the bat, uh, as much as I was very interested in, you know, I think it's there's a certainly worthwhile to, you know, meet people where they are in education. And, and, you know, if kids are interested in Fortnite, this might be a good gateway for them into to being interested in Canadian history. But it, it's a very weird mix in that Remembrance Day is a very, you know, solemn holiday. And Fortnite is this very wacky game, you know, that really doesn't take itself very seriously. Um, so was kind of interested to see how those two flavors mix together and what could be made. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll start off by just loading into the map. So I, being a complete Fortnite newbie, had no idea. It took me a lot of Googling to even figure out how to get into this map. Uh, I'll switch over to Fortnite now. So the way you do this, uh, this is the creative mode hub. Uh, I think it's kind of Halloween themed right now, which is very, again, right away that tonal dissonance with Remembrance Day kind of hits you. Uh, and yeah, so then no explanation at all here <laughs> how to load into a custom map, but what I learned through Googling is you go up to one of these portals that is already set to a different map. And you can see here it says E to change destination. And the island code you're going to want is 5053 Three three zero two four eight four seven. So put that in. You can see it's Remembrance Island. Um, so yeah, part of my you know curiosity about this map was just you know the Royal Canadian Legion made a Fortnite map. Like, how did that happen? Who who made this thing? Uh, doing a looking into it, kind of reading some of the news articles about it. It was made by um, Pro Bono, pitched to the Royal Canadian Legion by an ad agency called uh, Wonderman Thompson Canada. And uh, they even, um, it says they partnered with a licensed Fortnite builder. Uh, so the map builder is, uh, I believe this uh, person with the handle JXDVN. So they're a uh, Fortnite map builder who worked with Wonderman Thompson Canada, the ad agency, to pitch this idea to the Legion, which makes a little more sense to me than the Legion making it themselves. Uh, but yeah, so you can see I changed uh, this portal now into a portal to Remembrance Island, so I'll head through and go check it out. So, um, this actually isn't my first time playing this. I, I kind of wanted to get a feel for it before doing any kind of commentary. Um, I played it last night, and for some reason the entire map was at night. I'm not entirely clear why. Like, is there some kind of um, dynamic day-night cycle that j I just happened to catch it at the wrong time? Uh, the map is unfortunately nearly unplayable at night. Uh, you can't see the landmarks. Uh, you can barely see the path with your flashlight. Uh, so that was kind of a, a bad first experience with it. Um, 
but I tried it again today, and uh, now, thankfully uh, for this stream, it's also still in daylight. Uh, so let's see right off the bat. Welcome to Remembrance Island. Uh, there is no battle fought here, only respect for Canadian veterans who fought for freedom and made the ultimate sacrifice. Follow the poppies, head to the memorial, and honor the fallen with a salute and a moment of silence. Stream, share, tell your friends. And uh, the links for the Legion and um, how to get a poppy. I unfortunately don't have a poppy myself for the stream. Uh, I live in the States now, and it's very hard to get them here. So uh, that's something I'll have to plan for next year if I'm going to do another Remembrance Day stream. But all right, let's get started. Um, I just mentioned to kind of want to come at this stream, um, you know, kind of taking a page from uh, other developers I know who stream, who can kind of play a game and critique it and, and talk about maybe the, the craft behind it while they're playing. Uh, this is the first attempt at this. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to come off as too harsh, I guess, generally. Um, you know, this was clearly a labor of love and, uh, you know, a very worthwhile project to try and bring a new audience to Canadian history. And, you know, um, you know, honor uh, the sacrifice of many, many soldiers who fought in many wars. But um, I think it's, you know, this is an interesting object, an interesting level, game, what have you. And uh, I think we can also kind of appreciate it on that terms of how successful is it as a level, as a teaching experience. Um, how successful is it generally to play uh, something like this in Fortnite? So, so yeah, I kind of want to dig into that a little bit. So right off the bat, uh, we're here on what appear to be the beaches of Normandy. And uh, on the map, you can see I'm on the top left, the beaches. Um, I mean, right away, you get the funny, just me opening this map screen, you get the kind of funny dissonance of playing this in Fortnite, in that there's all these challenges on the left side of the screen about, like, finding weapons and riding a motorboat and <laughs> searching for chests and all these things you can't do in this level. Um, you know, it's really only designed for, uh, you know, teaching and honoring, but yeah, right away that the dissonance is, is felt. Not only that, the fact that I'm on the beaches in Normandy here with my enormous shovel. <laughs> um, so I said, this isn't my first time playing the level. Uh, a couple of things I kind of learned the hard way it's just from a level design perspective, right off the bat, um, the impression I get, you know, I have this path here that's suggested to me that, that that's pretty much the direction that we want me to go. Um, there's also kind of this intriguing path over to the left, but uh, I will say from, from PV experience, that goes nowhere. Um, and generally this, this map does not reward exploration. There's not a lot to be found if you go off the beaten path. So if I go off the path here, you know, clearly it's all still themed in, in Normandy, but there really isn't anywhere to go up here. Um, you know, when you start the map, it tells you to follow the poppies, which I think might be like just a social media hashtag they're using, but it actually is not a bad um, tip for just playing the level is, is if you're not sure where to go, just look for these poppies and kind of head that direction. That probably means there's something interesting over there. Uh, another weird thing that, that I kind of struggled with on my first playthrough is these things. So these are teleporters, and there's there's a bunch of them in the map. But, you know, this one is right away, right off the bat, very, you know, quite easy to find. It kind of clips through this um, object a little bit, and you kind of see it from the other side, the, the particles. And if you take this teleporter, you know, I can take it now, you end up in just later in the map, uh, which totally kind of throws the sequence of things out of order sometimes and, and makes you see things in an order that I don't believe was intended. So I, I don't quite 
understand why these were added. I, I kind of wondered if it was for either development purposes or there's something I'm not quite clear on, but like, I take this teleporter and I don't know, am I supposed to go left? Am I supposed to go right? How far into history have I advanced? So I'm just going to try not to use those generally and instead follow the, the map as, it, as I think it was more designed. So, beaches in Romandy. So I assume uh, this being Canadian history, this would be Juno Beach. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of visiting Juno Beach a couple of years ago, which was a really uh, educational experience and just very impressive to see it uh, in person. Okay. Germany invaded Western Europe in the spring of 1940, establishing formidable defensive positions stretching from the Spanish border to Scandinavia. So these defenses harmed, formed part of what was called the Atlantic Wall. And uh, really just mind-boggling scale of, yeah, defenses really up and down the coast of Norway, Denmark, you know, all the way around the Netherlands, Belgium, France. Um, just unbelievable number of bunkers and guns and mines and traps and all sorts of just, you know, check hedgehogs. And uh, where the Allied forces landed in Normandy was actually not one of the stronger parts of the Atlantic Wall. So the shores of Fortress Europe were studded with mines, barbed wire bunkers, artillery, machine gun nests, anti-tank walls, and thousands of troops. Uh, just to talk about the level design real quick. So this is this is good what it's doing here. It's kind of funneling you so that you have kind of the, the, the way these um, obstacles are placed. You almost you have no choice to kind of do the right thing and to see the text. Uh, there's really nothing drawing you away from it. So that there's little pinch points over there showing the text. That's, that's good. It's always good in a game if you can't help but do the right thing, particularly because there's no other kind of indicator of where the text is going to be. Like, it just kind of appears out of nothing. It's well framed here between these two posts, but yeah. So we're going to follow the poppies. Oh, again, another pinch here that means you can't help but see the text, which is good. Uh, establishing a beachhead in Normandy was the key to winning the war, and on June the 6th, 1944, Known to history as D-Day, the Allies began their attack. Um, actually, a little, not maybe quite as well-known history fact is that the Canadians also participated in a sort of proto-D-Day earlier in the war called the Dieppe Raid. It was kind of a, um, a much smaller scale proof of concept for D-Day, and uh, unfortunately went very poorly, um, partly due to the kind of lack of coordination between the Navy and the Army and the Air Forces and the kind of that that test run kind of showed how critical it was going to be to really align them all to the same purpose uh, to make a beach landing work. I'll try not to, you know, I'm, I'm clearly as I said, very interested in this uh, in Canadian history and in, in World War II history. I know a thing or two, but I, I'm not a historian or an authoritative source by any means. But so I'll try to keep the uh, the actual history commentary to, to a minimum because I don't want to say anything stupid. But uh, yeah, as 450 Canadian paratroopers dropped inland, more than 14,000 infantry and armored armored division troops came ashore at Juno Beach that day. Uh, so yeah, Juno Beach, one of the five beaches that the Allies landed on on D-Day. Uh, the Canadians landed at Juno, the British at uh, Golden Sword Beaches, and the Americans at uh, Omaha and Utah Beaches. Omaha perhaps being the most famous from um, the pictures in Hollywood films. That was the beach from 
Saving Private Ryan. But yeah, Juno Beach. That's where the Canadians landed. So... Just on, again, a level design perspective... Pretty sure the map that, that this is trying to direct me left here along the coast where these poppies are, but because I came up this hill and this like gap was very framed for me, it also makes me want to go straight ahead. But I think if I go straight ahead, I just end up kind of tangled in this barbed wire and I end up not going anywhere. So this this little gap is misleading. I think I'm supposed to go this way. Let me follow the poppies, which. I mean, not a bad trick for for uh, guiding the player through these levels. Okay, so I have two options here. I can either go down this path, or I can go into this building. I'm gonna go this way, and there's another information card here. Maybe I'll try going the other way next. So I'm here on the map. Okay, and this is liberating Europe. So this probably makes sense. Like this is the other way goes to a World War One history site. So I'll keep on the World War Two theme first. Okay. Canadians. Oh, Canadians fought past strong German defenses to capture an eight-kilometer stretch of coastline, penetrating further inland than any other Allied forces. As days went on, Navy and Air Force support kept sea lanes clear and swept German warplanes from the skies over Normandy while troops pushed inland. Normandy was just the beginning of the end. It took 11 more months of battle to defeat the enemy. In all, 45,000 Canadians gave their lives in World War II. So... Um, I remember when I first played this, I got to this point and was a bit confused because I wasn't sure. This rubble feels like it should be maybe the end of a road. It's kind of a suggestion of something around here. And because it's Fortnite, you can kind of jump around goofily and get over a lot of things. But I believe um, the intended path is not to go this way, but instead to change tracks to the... Um, other way that I was looking at. I think there's there's my one biggest critique of this map. It's that um, there's a lot kind of a tension here between you know all the content is on this kind of golden path, so there's really not much incentive to explore. Yet, um, oftentimes the player hits these dead ends where it's not clear where to go next. So I'm gonna assume you know this little um, area is finished and now I'm gonna go up the hill and down this path I don't think this is where I'm supposed to go so I won't but again yeah just lots of I feel like this level and you know I don't want to second guess the person who made it, you know, that they, they kind of made it with whatever design values they had in mind, but I think if I was making a map like this, I would be much more clearly signposted just where you have to go next. Like, the fact that there's these little side paths where there's no content. It's not like I'm rewarded for exploring and seeing some side area and kind of, oh, you know, I learned something I wasn't gonna, otherwise going to know. Just kind of two paths to the same place. Um, I would have been tempted to put this on a much more linear path. Okay, so maybe I made a mistake if I had instead gone right out of this building from the World War II section. I think this is now the trench warfare section, so maybe this is the way I should have gone. Yeah, World War I trench warfare. Canadian soldiers were introduced to dirt, disease, and death in the trenches of the Western Front in February of 1915. It would take another three years of battle and attrition to break through. 
culminating in a series of offensives known as the Hundred Days. By the time the armistice was signed on November 11th, 1918, over 650,000 Canadians had served and over 66,000 had been given their lives during World War I. Um, so this is there's some kind of good level design going on here where I'm coming out from this low place and I want to see over this ridge and I'm rewarded when I go over the ridge with this cool view this cool view of the pool of peace so yeah that was just nicely framed you know it's one of these things you can't miss if you happen to have gone through the trenches correctly, um, you just get a really, really nice reveal into this this cool view. So this is an area again. Um, the first time I played this map, um, well, first time I played it, it was it was at night and I couldn't see anything, so I had no idea where to go next. Um, again, there's one of these confusing teleporters. It's kind of semi-hidden, not clear if it's meant to go that way. So there's kind of a couple paths I could take from here. I feel like I need to... There's no clear way to go forward, so I really have to go left or right around the uh, the pool. Uh, left has no poppies, so I'm going to assume that's the language that tells me where to go next. So I'm going to go right instead and kind of try to use these poppies as breadcrumbs to find out where to go next. Um, I know from experience that this is the way to go kind of right around the pool following the poppies, but I will say, first time I played it, there was this other path that also seemed signposted by poppies to kind of go over the mountains, but um, from what I remember, this goes nowhere. So, again, just kind of some misleading um, dead ends. But yeah, this is the right way to go. So it may look peaceful now, but in the early morning hours of June the 7th, 1917, this was the site of one of the largest non-nuclear explosions of all time. Beginning at 3.10 a.m., Allied forces detonated 19 enormous mines buried deep below German positions along a ridge outside of Messin, France. So I, uh, that's actually incorrect. I didn't know this beforehand, but just while making this video, I looked it up. Uh, Messin is actually... Uh, the French name for Messin, a uh, town in Belgium, but it's right on the border, so easy to make that mistake. The resulting blast sent earth, steel, and concrete high into the air, lighting the dark sky on fire and killing an estimated 10,000 German soldiers. Uh, just real quick, I think you saw me here make a mistake where I was going to head up onto this ridge, I would have missed that text cue. So, a bit of weird level design here. Why would I be, you know, why have this high ridge to draw me up when the content is over here? Feels like we could have used a pitch, uh, pinch here so I could have not avoided that text. And again, one of the kind of the consequences, unfortunately, of not having a clear language of like where to find these text cues is that just there being a, a lamp isn't enough because you know there's a lamp right here and there's no text cue here so so if I want to look ahead it's like where the next text cue is I can make a guess yeah, there's probably one here no so I'll just keep walking along I wanted to say by the way as I said I hadn't I wasn't as familiar with this this site or this event in World War one uh, before playing this game so that's that's cool I got to learn something new. And uh, apparently this is a real place that you can visit in, in Belgium. You can see these uh, pools that uh, were created after the, uh, the explosions in World War One. Okay, I'll try to find, follow the posts, follow the signs. I uh, see there's the other area over there of content. Oh, you can see the Vimy Memorial kind of on the horizon there. So it's cool. It's always nice, um, you know. Even though I wasn't really drawn to look at it, um, nice to have kind of long distance goals on the horizon when you're when you're playing a level. Kind of gives you a sense of space. Because uh, we look at the map now, um, 
So this was Normandy, uh, this was liberating Europe, trench warfare, and the, uh, the explosion at Messin. And now I'm coming up this way, and this must be the Vim Memorial here. And so let's find out what's in this section. Battle of Ypres, and I'm 90% certain that's the right way to pronounce it. Uh, I've heard Ypres, I've heard, um, I think the British soldiers just called it Wipers, which I think is way off, but that was uh, kind of historically the, the Tommy's nickname for it. Uh, yeah, so let's head into uh, what I will call Ypres, <laughs> hoping that that is the correct pronunciation. Ypres was one of these towns that um, just kind of went back and forth to the site of many battles in World War I. Uh, so they've kind of depicted it as, as ruined, which is very cool. I think that's the first text prompt of this area. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I think that's the first one. Cool. Oh, nope, nope, there was one here. Oh, how do I trigger it? Ah, there we go, cool. Again, just having no indication of where these text prompts are gonna pop up makes them really hard to find. This just seems like there's just like a lot of angles where this one's not activating. But uh, World War One left whole towns in complete ruin. Canadians fighting in the Second Battle of Ypres in Belgium were greeted with terrible scenes of destruction. Ypres is also where the Germans used poison gas for the first time, and the first chance for inexperienced Canadian troops that distinguished themselves. Fighting to maintain the front around Ypres was fierce. Tired, sick, and gasping for air through soaked and muddy handkerchiefs, the Canadians held on. Canadians became known as a force to be reckoned with, as a force to reckon with. But the cost was high. In just 48 hours, there were 6,035 Canadian casualties. More than 2,000 died. Um, that first sentence is kind of interesting. I, for perhaps American audiences, um, you know, they're much less familiar, typically, with World War I. Um, Canada, I think World War I plays a much bigger part in Canadian history. Part of the reason being that. Um, the Canadians are kind of um, developed a, a reputation of, of fighting very effectively in the First World War. Uh, they were coming on the scene as kind of a um, as a new dominion. You know, the Canada had only become its own country in 1867. So, you know, 1914, when the war started, started is really not very long after that, and. Um, it was kind of unclear to what degree Canada would be coming to this conflict kind of as its own country or as just kind of another arm of the British Empire. And, um, you know, World War One kind of became this, this um, forcing factor. Uh, yeah, that's not the way to put it, but it, it was a big um, shift in, in kind of Canadian identity and, and really, to some degree, it, it's at least argued that, that it helped create the Canadian identity. Um, kind of, of course, a lot of more complications about that. Obviously, um, at the time, um, you know, French Canadians in, in, in Quebec, uh, there's a lot of conflict there over conscription. A lot of um, French Canadians didn't want to fight for, for the British Empire. Um, on the other hand, some French Canadians felt very strongly about going to help their, um, you know, their their brothers and sisters in in France. Uh, so it's so a very conflicting emotions there. Um, it's been a long time since I read it now, but the book uh, "Marching as to War" by Pierre Burton uh, talks a lot about these interesting issues in, in very interesting ways. Um, and again, try not to be too amateur historian in this uh, stream, but uh, but. Uh, it's always a very interesting kind of identity aspect of World War One for for Canadians. That's why I think it plays such a 
bigger role in our in our memory of the uh, of history than than it does for perhaps other countries, particularly compared to uh, the United States. Which okay, so now we've we've made it through Ypres, and we're coming through this gate here. So the Vimy Ridge Memorial marks the site where all four divisions of the Canadian Corps attacked and were victorious together for the first time. By mid-afternoon, through driving wind, snow, and sleet, Canadian divisions were in command at the whole crest of the ridge. The balance of territory was taken within three days. The fighting was hard and costly. 10,602 brave Canadians were casualties of the Battle of Vimy. So, um, before we go too much further in here, yeah, this this first um, marker kind of talks why why Vimy is so important for for Canadian military history. And it's it's this where um, you know um, four divisions of the Canadian Corps that were kind of embedded with the the um, British. In many conflicts, uh, this was the first fight where all of them were involved in the same battle, uh, or at least in the same uh, attack together. So it was kind of a point of pride for for Canada. Um, what's cool about the uh, the level design here, of course, is that again, it's this moment of really setting up this this big vista that's coming up, really funneling in, you into it and creating a sense of anticipation. Yeah, it's, it's a very smart way to kind of make this reveal pretty cool. And uh, there it is, the Vimy Ridge Memorial, as shown in Fortnite. Um, I sadly have never gotten a chance to visit the memorial myself. Um, it's always been kind of on my bucket list because it's, it's very, um, you know, iconic and it's just a wonderful piece of a wonderful commemoration to, to Canada's uh, sacrifice. Let's see, I think I missed one of the texts here. The memorial stands here for all who sacrificed. It is here we pay silent tribute at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month. So the um, 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month, obviously a reference to the armistice that was signed in 1918. Uh, that was the cessation of hostilities between um, the Allied powers and Germany. Um, worth remembering that that doesn't mean that Germany surrendered. Uh, that actually, um, the you know, the process of ending the war actually came a year later at the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, but. 11, 11, 11 was when the guns stopped and the armistice was signed. And uh, that is why we have Remembrance Day on the 11th. Okay, so a um, little extra bit of Canadian imagery here. We have the um, John McRae in, in Flanders Fields poem. The poppies and the, the, the graves row on row. Just to be kind of a reference to that. And yeah, up ahead, the Vimy Ridge Memorial. I don't know if this maps to how the Vimy Memorial itself is laid out, or if this is just kind of a more tribute to the, the, the imagery of the In Flanders Fields poem, but... Okay. So this super confused me on my first playthrough when it says uh, salute to honor the, the fallen. Um, again, I don't play Fortnite very much, so I have no idea where the salute button is. Um, so initially I just like opened the emotes menu. I think it's on, no, it's on one of the buttons. And all the options I could see were to dance. So obviously I don't want to do that. Um, so Googling it, the only way to salute is to have the salute emote, which is was like a rare drop in season three of Fortnite or something. So not 
actually uh, unlockable for me. Uh, so I unfortunately have no way of un uh, saluting here at the, at the Vimir Ridge Memorial. Uh, so, so I won't be able to do that, unfortunately. But uh, maybe I can just observe a moment of silence instead. So, um, obviously a very, very simplified model of the, the Vimy Ridge Memorial. The, the real Vimy Ridge Memorial has these beautiful statues on it, and it's extremely complex. I believe it has a view of the ocean that, that is not reflected here. Um, so yeah, obviously just kind of a stand-in for that, and the, the game does a good job of making sure that you, you see it from far away so you get a little bit of a um, feels bigger than it is I suppose I don't know if force perspective is the right word but it's definitely um, doesn't hold up unfortunately to, to close examination given how uh, kind of simplified it is but this is probably the best anyone could do you know given the tile set or whatever of, of Fortnite is probably pretty limited in what you can actually make so so yeah, that's the, that is as close to him as you can get. So I get the impression that that's supposed to be kind of the end of this level. But if you look on the map, um, we went through Ypres. But there's kind of one area, it's two areas we haven't been to yet. Um, this one here on my left and this one here on my right. So I'll go to the one uh, on my camera right, character left, first. But but a little weird, just level design-wise, that I can go see kind of the what feels like the big finale first before visiting these other things. Um, again, I think if I was one who's being tasked to make with this, I would probably would have ended on this, and that would have been kind of where where the level ended, and not not here. So, defending hill three fifty five. So I thought this was a nice language when I first saw it. Um, the kind of the lantern with the bench. And then the text framed by the bench. If I'd been looking for these the whole way, that wouldn't have been a bad language to, uh, to communicate. Like, hey, here's a text prompt. But let's see. After World War II, the Korean Peninsula became a lightning rod for communist and democratic interests. Tension grew, and the North invaded the South on June 25th, 1950. Uh... And the, the the kind of the description for the the motivations of the war, which obviously are extremely complicated, but it became a lightning rod for communist and democratic interests. Kind of an interesting, <laughs> an interesting summary. Again, uh, I, I'd read kind of a news article saying that like these were all designed to fit within like 150 characters, so you really do have to be quite brief. Uh, and, and Korea being such a complicated conflict, uh, sure. That's, that's probably as good a summary as any. Again, not that I'm any expert on the Korean War or anything, I just... Uh, I guess it's the passive voice that kind of gets to me. Became a lightning rod. It kind of... maybe... just kind of glosses over um, a lot of com complexity there. When diplomacy proved unsuccessful, the United Nations Security Council voted to employ force in defense of peace and freedom. Control of the 30th parallel changed hands several times before ceasefire negotiations turned the conflict into a war of patrols and hotspots.
One such hotspot was Hill 355, a strategic point above front lines and supply routes. Every Canadian battalion in Korea spent time here at some point. Unfortunately, here that the text is kind of embedded in the post. Canadians fought several major battles over Hill 355, taking heavy losses but holding their ground. In total, 516 brave Canadians were lost in Korea. So yeah, this is the Korean War Memorial. So the last area of the map that we haven't visited is this one. And so it seems like you can get to it from here. And I also know that I could have gone directly there from the uh, reflecting pool. There was a kind of a shortcut into it. And actually, this entrance is the most, uh, the, like the title card for it is here. So just some really weird level design here where, you know, I followed the kind of the golden path as, as seen best suggested to me. I ended on the finale here. Uh, I did this little side area here and actually the best presentation for what I want to see next is to go all the way backwards through Ypres back here. But uh, I'll run that way. Again, kind of just a, an unusual mix where where there really is content here that seems like it's supposed to be um, kind of read and understood in a, in a linear order, but that you can access in a non-linear order in a way that then it doesn't make much sense. So I, I, I question whether that was a good design decision. Um, I think, to me, I think you could have gone one of two ways with this. You either have an, a map with, with a lot of content that is out of order and very rewarding to, to um, therefore very rewarding to explore. You know, you'd see a, uh, something that looked interesting and you'd go up to it and oh you'd, you'd find some text prompt you didn't know was there and you'd um, learn something new but as it is there's there's very little off the beaten path in this level it really lends itself uh, best to to kind of a linear ordering but but then um, but then it's actually quite circuitous to, to find your way through the kind of the intended order so here the Afghan mission so this is kind of the closest to, to modern day, obviously. And uh, when I was playing in the level at night, as I said, um, this text was incredibly difficult to find because when you're walking around at night with just this flashlight, <laughs> trying to find this text written on the ground, it's, it's very, very difficult to spot. So Canada's role in the international fight against terror and Afghanistan's oppressive Taliban regime began following the events of September 11, 2001. Um, so again, I happen to have prior knowledge that there's another text prompt over here in this path that leads back to Vimy. Yeah. The Taliban were removed from power, but Canadian forces were still frequent targets of insurgent attacks any time they ventured outside the wire. So, yeah, I guess if I had done this first, this would have led me back to the, the Vimy Memorial, but um, I, I have a lot of trouble understanding this section of the map. This feels a bit unfinished to me, because, like, so I've read two text prompts. Presumably there is more to say about the, the, the Canadian participation in the war in Afghanistan, but where is the next prompt? I, I have absolutely no idea. Um, you know, it seems to be leading me towards this building here. There's this guard tower you can climb. Uh, questionable staircase design, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I went up here to kind of demonstrate, but, like, this is a dead end. There's nothing up here. There's, there's nothing uh, you, know, you kind of expect being led all the way up these stairs that you might get to find another piece of content. And in fact, if I remember correctly, there's actually no more content on the war in Afghanistan. There's this kind of this gate here that you can go through. But unless I am very silly and I, I just can't find it, I believe this is just the end of the map. 
there's there's um, no more information on on the war in Afghanistan in this area. This is supposed to be some kind of you know forward operating base of some sort, but even this kind of very attractive radar tower just has nothing. Oh, there might be one here. Nope. No, I'm wrong. <laughs> so I think this is the end of the map, kind of ending with a whimper. Uh, I've seen, you know, we started at Normandy, we went to um, Liberating Europe, Trench Warfare, Reflecting Pool, Ypres, here, um, Vimy Memorial, um, Hill 355, and now uh, Afghanistan. But, yeah, doesn't, uh, gotta say, oh, whoa, oh, I found it, found it, the last one. The Canadian mission officially ended on March 2014, and all 158 armed for Canadian Armed Forces members died to help restore peace and freedom to Afghanistan. And, and that's where we end, facing this, this brick wall, or this rock wall. Uh, there's, there's a teleporter here that goes to the reflecting pool. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, again, kind of thinking about this, uh, the pool of peace, sorry, thinking about this map, um, again, I, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting constraints here for this kind of very goofy Fortnite game, um, and the kind of limitations of the creative mode. I think kind of, you know, the, um, JXDVN who was making this map had a lot of constraints to work with and and all things considered, you know, I'm, I think this is a very interesting project. Again, thinking about, is it even possible to teach someone, um, to teach Canadian history and to do justice to, um, you know, Canada's war dead through, through this game Fortnite, which is very goofy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, I think given the creative limitations that this game had, um, being set in Fortnite and, you know, being the limitations of this creative mode where you, you can only have a very limited palette and what you can place. I think it's it's um, quite impressive how well it, it, you know, recreates certain environments and monuments and uh, scenes from Canadian war history. Um, I think there's some questionable level design decisions. I think, um, you know, again, this is my third time playing through this and only on the third time that I really get a sense of where to go next and, and, and trying to avoid all the dead ends and kind of find the content in an optimal route. Um, but just for sheer um, weird combination of flavors, I think it's, it's, I'm glad it exists. This, this weird map um, <laughs> pitched by an ad agency, uh, seemingly outsourced to a Fortnite modder uh, and level designer um, and being promoted as being made by the Royal Canadian Legion itself. Um, set in this kind of wacky game of Fortnite, it's, it's definitely a, a series of interesting decisions that led to it even existing, but um, you know, as a, as a as a Canadian and a Canadian history enthusiast, I'm I'm glad it exists, and I hope I hope it has you know at least some kids who are playing Fortnite and interested in it, and maybe happen to stumble upon it. Uh, though the the method of getting into the map is is a little bit uh, Byzantine that. Um, I'd be very curious to see what a young person's reaction would be to this game. Would they, would they think it was fun and interesting and cool, or would it be kind of 
like, hello, fellow kids. <laughs> kind of trying to reach out. Um, you know, the, the, these efforts can always kind of backfire spectacularly. Uh, kids have a pretty good, you know, um, bullshit detector, for lack of a better word, and they can maybe see pretty transparently through an, an effort like this to make them learn. But, uh, yeah, that has been uh, Remembrance Island by JXDVN, a creative mode custom map in Fortnite. Uh, that was, I guess, uh, endorsed by the Royal, uh, you know, officially endorsed by the Royal Canadian Legion. So yeah, this, this uh, map came out for Remembrance Day. Um, this, this video is hopefully coming out on Remembrance Day, uh, and you know, if this video or this level interested you, um, highly recommend. Um, you know, if you're you're interested in in, in kind of World War One in general, um, the book I would recommend is *The Guns of August* by Barbara Tuckman. Um, covers kind of the the opening moves of the war between um, primarily France and Germany and, and England as well and Russia um, you know before the Canadians were involved but but definitely a, a very gripping narrative of those events and, and really digs into the details of, of why that conflict came to a head in the way it did how kind of events um, got away from from any of the people in charge seemingly and um, how the, the dominoes were started falling <laughs> in real time. Uh, the other piece of World War I media I would highly recommend is uh, the game Valiant Hearts by Ubisoft. Um, a very respectful but very thorough, very human humanist look at um, the conflict and all the sides involved. Um, it's it's kind of a puzzle adventure game, uh, but uh, I think that has got to be the best depiction of war uh, in a real cost of war sense uh, in a video game that I've ever seen. So yeah, um, uh, Guns of August, Valiant Hearts and Remembrance Island. Not a bad way to uh, commemorate Remembrance Day. Thank you very much.